Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with the best books of 2023. This is one of my favorite videos to film every year. I think it's every booktuber's favorite video to film every year. And it's a particularly good year for me because since I have been on booktube, I'll be honest, this is easily the best reading year that I have ever had. It has been packed with five stars and packed with a lot of books that I would consider new all-time favorites, quite frankly. And so it was actually really hard to narrow down this list this year. And in years past, I've actually struggled to find a top 10 to talk about. So I cheated a little bit. We don't have a top 10, we have a top 12, just because there were a couple I felt like really needed to be here. As usual, this is all over the place. You never know what you're going to get on this channel. But the majority of these, I think, are more backlist. But I do have quite a few 2023 releases here, which is also kind of shocking when I think on years past because I think I favored backlist a little bit more than new releases in past years. So I'm really excited that there were a lot of really great new releases this year that caught my eye. So let's go on and get into this because I feel like we're going to be here for a while. This is going to be in no particular order except for my top three. So let's go on and get into the list. The first book that I want to talk about is a book that I finished actually rather recently, and that is Big Swiss by Jen Vegan. And I had a good feeling about this book before I went into it. I had a feeling that it was going to be for me. I just didn't know how much. And this is a book that's featured on this list basically because it is so wild and crazy and you're just having the time of your life reading it because you don't know what's going to happen next and you don't know how far the main character is going to take this. This is what I would call kind of an unhinged woman book. And it's about our main character, Greta, who is a transcriptionist for a sex therapist and she hears the sex therapist talking to a new client one day who she names Big Swiss because the woman's from Switzerland and she doesn't know her name. And through a wild series of events, she gets involved with this woman and basically makes up an entire identity just to be friends with her because she doesn't want her to know that she knows literally every intimate detail of her life. And this is one that just really left my jaw on the floor because I did not know how far the main character was willing to take it. And I just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I feel like Big Swiss is kind of a great book to talk about in terms of representing my entire reading year because that was definitely the focus for me this year was just to read for fun and to read books that I thought were really entertaining and I feel like that's such a weird thing to say because aren't we all reading to be entertained aren't we all reading for fun but I think I feel a lot of pressure here on booktube to read more of a variety of things or to read certain things that you think people want to hear about and I just kind of let that go this year and so I feel like Big Swiss is kind of a big indicator of that. It was kind of a book about letting things go, but it was also a book about change. This was a humorous book. So many things were happening. It was actually packed in so many ways, but I also felt like this had some really deep and introspective things to say about women, about women of a certain age, about careers, sexuality. I just thought this was really interesting on many different levels at the same time as being entertaining. And so this definitely had to wind up as one of my favorite books of the year. Next, I wanna talk about A Study in Drowning. I think this was a sleeper hit for a lot of people. It certainly was for me. And I think this is going to show up on a lot of best books of 2023. This was really, really fantastic. And it took me completely off guard. I have read Ava Reed in the past and I really didn't like her. And so I felt like I was going out on a limb by reading this, but this is semi a dark academia story. And I'm always a sucker for those. I'm always interested in reading dark academia. And I feel like this had a lot to say, not just about kind of academia in general, which I expected it to comment on, but it also really had a lot to say about the female experience in academia and relationships that you can form between your peers, but also your professors. And that was a really complex and interesting conversation that this book wanted to have. I've seen a lot of people talk about A Study in Drowning as being very blatant and very in your face with the messaging. And that's kind of similar to say, like the Barbie movie. I've seen a lot of people say that about the Barbie movie, that the messaging was so blatant it was Feminism 101. There are still people out there who need to hear these concepts and these conversations on a 101 level. And so I actually really appreciate what A Study in Drowning did because I thought it worked incredibly well. The setting was incredible to me. 
honestly, there was not a part of this book that didn't make me feel something. There was something really impactful going on in nearly every chapter. And I don't know if it was kind of where I was in my life when I picked this up. I was in a very particular mood and things had been going on in my own personal life when I picked this up that I think really made this feel a little bit more impactful than it would have otherwise. And so I think this was just the right book at the right time. I really picked this up at a time when I was going to be responsive to it. And I am so glad that I did. This stunned me. And I'm definitely going to pay attention to what Ava Reed comes out with in the future because this was utterly fantastic to me. Of all of those that I'm going to talk about today, there's something about A Study in Drowning that has made it remain very present for me. There's something about this one that feels incredibly special and I really can't describe why. Again, I just kind of feel like I was in the right place at the right time to read this novel. So maybe take that with a grain of salt. Maybe this isn't the highest recommendation, but it certainly worked for me personally. And it wanted to talk about a lot of things that I always find incredibly fascinating in books. And akin to Big Swiss, I just really appreciated what this book wanted to do on nearly every level. So I knew instantly this was going to be a favorite of the year. Another quiet book that really kind of crept up on me is Briefly A Delicious Life. This is a historical fiction. You might even call this a historical fantasy. And it's about a ghost that is haunting this monastery that George Sand comes to stay in in the 1800s. And this book just really had it all. I think when you read the description or you hear what this is about, you have a certain perception of what the book is going to be. And I personally thought the book was going to be incredibly depressing, but honestly, it was not. It always had a really wonderful, lighthearted, humorous quality to the writing that was just really cozy in so many ways. It really, really invited you in. And the main character, Blanca, easily one of my favorite characters of the year. The book was weird in all of the ways that I like. I really enjoy a weird literary fiction or a weird historical fiction. And and so this book had a bunch of elements that work for me elsewhere and it just combined them together because I really liked the literary commentary on George Sand. I really liked the conversation around women in the medieval period, which is when Blanca was alive. I just thought this was absolutely brilliant and it completely snuck up on me. I picked this up on kind of a whim and I assumed I would like it. I never pick up a book assuming that I'm going to hate it, but I was still really taken aback by just how much I liked this and how much it worked for me personally. I feel like this is a book that was just kind of designed for me and it was just so wonderful, cozy, beautiful, and the descriptions and the imagery of where they were, it was just so easy to visualize. And I think the older I get, that's a little bit harder for me as a reader. It's really hard for me to envision where you are. I sometimes need my hand to be held in terms of description nowadays. And so I really appreciated just how vivid the writing was. I thought this was really quotable. It was just incredibly beautifully written, which is another theme for the year. I feel like A Study in Drowning and Big Swiss were also really incredibly beautifully written. That's always something that I'm searching for is great prose. And it was definitely present here in Briefly A Delicious Life. This is the one I think I would recommend the most of the ones that I'm going to talk about today, not because I feel like it has the most mass appeal, but because it's a book I feel like people are sleeping on. And I think if you give it a chance, you'll also find it really charming. So this was definitely a favorite of the year. I read this in February and I knew almost instantly. This was also the year that I discovered Mona Awad and I read three Mona Awad books this year and I feel like you're going to assume that I'm going to say a particular title of hers, but it's not going to be the one you think. Even though I rated Bunny five stars, the one that has stuck with me and truly my favorite of hers is All's Well. I know this is a controversial opinion. I feel like a lot of people who love Mona Awad still don't really like this one. This just doesn't stick out to them in terms of her other novels. To me, this is the least weird of her books. And so if you've been put off by Mona Awad in the past because you think she's just going to be a bit strange for you, this is easily the least weird. But something I'm always going to be into, something I'm always going to pick up is a book that talks about Shakespeare at all. And so I really loved all of the Shakespeare conversations that happened in this book. This is about a woman with chronic illness trying to put on All's Well That Ends Well, but all of her students really want one of the more flashier plays. They want Macbeth, they want Hamlet. And a lot of it is a discussion around chronic pain and chronic illness and how people around you interpret your symptoms and for a while they're very sympathetic to you and then after a while they get kind of tired of the excuses 
that you're making and they start to think that you want to be sick. So definitely what stuck out to me about this book were the mental and also physical health conversations that were ongoing. It was absolutely brilliant to me. And I think a lot of people would call this kind of an unhinged woman story. You know what? The whole entire time, whenever this woman did anything, I said, good for you. Good for her. She deserves this. Get out there and do it, girl. I really 100% supported her. And so I think this was just a really interesting book. Now that I have read most of what Mona Awad has put out, to me this is really the most interesting book in her oeuvre because I think it's very different to Rouge or to Bunny. Bunny and Rouge are weird almost off the bat, but All's Well kind of sinks you into the world a little bit before things get really strange, but it's so Shakespearean because it is interacting with the Shakespeare play so blatantly, and also just in general with the world of the theater and the world of actors, I think there was a nice theatricality and weirdness to this that was able to be interpreted in multiple different ways. I think a lot of times you're reading a Mona Awad book and you think, is this really happening? Or is this happening in the way the character is conveying it to me. And that was done very, very well here, no pun intended, because I think this was incredibly smart. I think this allowed you as the reader to make up your own mind, but I think you could have easily argued in multiple different ways about what happened in this story and all of them would have been correct. This book was absolutely brilliant to me. And so Mona Awad has two five stars from me and Bunny and All's Well, but there's something about All's Well that was just really special to me and really stuck out to me personally. And I think Bunny gets a fair bit of play. I wanted to put Bunny on here as well, but I decided to say just one book per author. And I feel like All's Well needs a defender in its court and that's going to be me. This next book I feel is kind of controversial. I have seen some really great reviews of this, but I have also seen some really poor reviews of it and I completely understand why. That is The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Rashidi Chakshi. This is one of the most hauntingly beautiful novels of the year in my opinion. And to be frank, it is one of the books that has stuck with me the longest. That's essentially why I wanted to put it on this list. This was kind of an honorable mention initially but I do definitely feel like it's a favorite of the year. And this book, I think, was marketed wrongly. I think that's really the reason why there have been so many poor reviews of it, because I think this was marketed as a straight up adult fantasy book. And there's something about this book that kind of defies genre, quite frankly. This is mostly about fairy tales and folk tales. And so the book is structured like a fairy tale or a folk tale. And so a lot of the action happens off page. You don't know as much about the characters personally as you might like to because so many of them are kind of archetypes. They're standing in for a certain fairy tale archetype. And I personally thought this was brilliant because I really love fairy tales and folk tales and I love the structure of them specifically. So I could kind of see what Roshini Chakshi was going for and how she set this book up. And so to me, it was rather brilliant. But of every book on my list, this is definitely the one I see why people hate it because this is a very particular book and I feel like it's meant for a very particular reader. My gosh, it was meant for me. I was blown away from page one. Roshini Chakshi is one of my favorite authors actually. And so I was really excited to hear that she was going to do an adult fantasy book. And this was so utterly fantastic. I'm just really glad this is how she started her adult fantasy journey because I was blown away by this. The quotes are insane. I think if you've read Roshini Chakshi before, you know she is known for her incredibly beautiful prose. And most certainly that's present here. This book is really quotable. I was tabbing it in places. I really want to reread it just to annotate it because I thought it had so much to say not just in terms of the plot, but also in terms of how it commented on the conception of the fairy tale and certain archetypes, kind of the female villain, but also the innocent female princess, the prince rescuing the princess. This had so much going on and a lot of it was in subtext. A lot of it I feel wasn't that blatant, but I personally really liked this book for how it made me think. This was just absolutely stunning to me and I would like more people to pick it up, but I kind of want you to know what you're getting yourself into when you pick this one up. It's not a standard fantasy story by any stretch of the imagination. In some ways it feels a little bit more lit ficky than fantasy, but I think that really works for me. Another book I fully anticipate seeing on a lot of people's best books of the year, Alone With You in the Ether by Olivia Blake. Olivia Blake, has got to be the most interesting author of the year for me because I have tried her multiple times. 
One time, just okay. One time, I DNF'd the book. This time, completely blown away. Instant five stars, like knew within the first chapter I was going to be rating the book five stars. Knew probably by the end of the second that it was going to be a favorite of the year. This is so vastly different, I think, than anything else that Olivia Blake has been publishing because this is contemporary, I won't call it romance because even though it's definitely a romance story, it's definitely a love story between two characters, I don't feel like it's as straightforward a romance as some other books. And so this was really, really unique to me. In a year where I have really experimented with reading romance and getting into romance as a genre, this really stands out to me, I guess because it's not technically a part of that genre. It's a little bit, again, more literary fiction than romance. But it stands out to me mostly in terms of characterization and how fully we understood these characters separately, but then how well we understood them as a couple and how well they fit together, how natural it seemed for them to be together. I think it was interesting. I think the changes that they went through as characters were really, really brilliant because I think it made sense and you wanted to root for them as a couple, but at the same time, you saw some of why they shouldn't be together. One of the main characters is an artist. I just always love artists in books, but our other main character is obsessed with time travel and he's obsessed specifically with bees. He kind of thinks bees and the hive and hexagon specifically are the key to understanding time travel. And it was so fascinating to me on nearly every page that there was some kind of symbology having to do with the hive or having to do with bees. And then from our artist's perspective, things were always described in terms of lighting, color. I just thought this was so beautifully written. I really do think that's the theme of the year for me, as always. Is the book beautifully written? I'm probably going to give it five stars. And this was no exception. This has got to be the most beautifully written book of the year, in my opinion. Aside from Last Tale of the Flower Bride, this blew me away in terms of the quality of the prose. And that's why I keep trying Olivia Blake. That's why I'm really interested in her. I think I love her writing style, but I don't necessarily always love her plots. They're very theoretical. And that worked here, given who the characters were and how they related to each other, kind of the theoretical discussions that the characters were having, the academic discussions they were having, that worked very well given who the characters were. And I also feel like this book was a much smaller scale than some of her other novels. And that also worked well for me, kind of the insular setting. I love an urban fantasy. I love a historical fantasy. I love dark academia. I love everything else that Olivia Blake is into. But my gosh, I hope this is not the only contemporary book that she plans on putting out because I kind of think this is where she has been able to shine the brightest for me. This book is so memorable and is so special amongst all of her titles, in my opinion. And I also think this was a really special book among new releases this year. So this was definitely one of my favorites of the year. I have been thinking about it nearly constantly since it came out. This next book I'm going to say kind of is an honorable mention because at the time of reading it, I did not give this book five stars, but this is just one of those books that stuck with me and really kind of haunted me at night, and that is Madalena and the Dark. This was another hauntingly beautiful novel. This is historical fiction, but it also kind of has a historical fantasy bent. There are elements here that don't necessarily add up and seem kind of speculative. But this is about kind of an all-girls school. It's about music in Venice in the 1700s. So there is kind of a dark academia element to this. And I personally think nearly everything about this book worked for me. I think this was really interesting because it was kind of rivals to lovers, but also rivals to friends, friends to rivals. This was about really complex female relationships, specifically within this school. And so there was a lot of conversation around marriage and wanting to get married in order to get out of this school. But once you get married, you no longer have the right to practice music publicly in Venetian society. And so a lot of the girls see marriage as the death of their career. They'll be able to play music for their husband, but they won't ever be able to play it publicly again. And so this was a really interesting world that I knew frankly nothing about because this was kind of the waning years of the Venetian Empire. And I thought this was absolutely fascinating from the historical perspective because I knew next to nothing about Venice during this time period. I'm just far more of a medieval girl, y'all know this. But I also really loved the characters here. Our two main female characters 
were incredibly complex and they were very difficult to figure out. You knew kind of what they wanted and what their ultimate goal was, but you didn't know how they were going to go about achieving it. This is a book, quite frankly, I am shocked I haven't seen more people talk about. I really have seen very few reviews of this. And for the pros alone, I feel like this would hit for a lot of people. I also think kind of a dark sapphic story is always interesting to me. And there's something about this that just felt very special. I think it was the way it was written and how the characters were framed. I think there's probably an argument to be made that maybe this book didn't actually have the best characterization or even the best plotting because there was something about it that was relatively confusing and you never felt on equal footing. I personally really liked that and I think it worked very well for the plot of this story, which was very murky and very magical in a way but in a way that made you question, is this really something supernatural or is it not? And so I just thought this was really interesting. The ending alone is really why I have thought about this for months on end because the ending was so haunting to me. This was a really beautiful book. And so I had to include it here. I was just going to say it was an honorable mention, but it's definitely a favorite of the year and I highly recommend it. I feel like this is another book that people are sleeping on. And if more people give it a chance, I think they would really, really like it. This feels very unhinged woman in a way, but it also feels kind of dark academia in a way. And the discussion around music was really fascinating to me because I'm not a musician. So I know next to nothing about music and I know next to nothing about instruments. And so once again, it was just kind of a whole new world being opened to me that I thought was really fascinating. I forgot to bring this book down here, but we do have an Emily Henry on the list. This is my favorite Emily Henry and it's people we meet on vacation. Yes, I feel like this is also kind of controversial. I feel like a lot of people favor her two word title romances and not people we meet on vacation. And I can see why there's something kind of Marmite, especially about the main male character. But I thought this was really introspective and also very complex in terms of characterization. This really stands out for me among her books. I read all four of her adult romances back to back this year. And I was really genuinely pleased by the large majority of them. I did not care for Beach Read. That wound up in my worst books of the year, but that's for another video. People We Meet on Vacation was just so special to me. I guess because I'm someone who's a sucker for the friends to lovers trope. And I think this just was a natural progression for their relationship. And I also think all of the things that kept them apart were also incredibly natural and were really realistic to an actual adult relationship. I feel like a lot of times you're reading romance and you think, gee, I would just never be in this situation because I wouldn't let it get this far. Or the reasons that people can't be together just seem so silly and you're wondering, why does that even matter to you? You could easily get around that. To me, People We Meet on Vacation was incredibly realistic for how the characters interacted with one another, but also why they had never approached the idea of a relationship previously. And so I just thought it was really remarkable. This had her banter, of course, which made this funny and lighthearted in a way, but this also felt deeper in many ways because one thing I really love about Emily Henry, there's always something else going on in her characters' lives. It's not just the hunt for a romantic partner, let's say. There's always something else going on and getting a romantic partner is just kind of an added bonus. They have something else in their life other than needing romance. And this was no exception here. I just thought this was absolutely amazing. And this is one of my favorite romances I've ever read. It was really hard to choose between this one and Book Lovers, but I'll be honest. This one just edges out Book Lovers a little bit to me because though it was a quieter book, I also felt like it was a more feeling book for me. It really hit me kind of hard sometimes, which was a little bit unexpected for me, but also made the reading experience very unique. So this is definitely my favorite Emily Henry, and it's one of my favorite books of the year. Speaking of romance, we have to have a fantasy romance here, and that's The Scarlet Veil. No one is more shocked than I am that I'm putting a Shelby Mahurin on my top books of the year because I absolutely hated her other series, and mostly it was because of the characters that I hated her other series, which was about witches. In fact, I never finished it. I hated the main characters of that series so much, but I decided to overlook it because this is vampire fantasy romance. And I thought, you know, I just have to take a chance on this. I had a good feeling about it and my gosh, it blew me away. This book is really long. I wanna say that first off. If you feel like a lot of these fantasy romances are really, really long, 
you're correct. And this one stands out to me because I feel like it took me a long time to get through this, but it was a joy every step of the way. The reason I would say it feels long is that it also doesn't feel like a lot happened in this, but I kind of think it was nice to have a book be slow because it allowed for a really natural progression between the main characters. And what I loved about this was the vampires. The vampires were exactly what I want them to be. They were gothic, they slept in coffins. I pictured them in high-necked collars with ruffles, big, beautiful, flowing, puffy white shirts. It was everything I want vampires to be. The way the main male character was described was obscenely attractive. And so I just really loved everything about this because it's everything I wanted out of a vampire fantasy romance. I don't typically like vampires in the fantasy sphere. And so I was really pleasantly surprised to see them done so well here. I just loved the description of their outfits. I loved, loved, loved everything about the vampires. And I also loved that our main female character, who was of course human, she really couldn't stand up to them. There was a believable quality to her interaction with the vampires, which made the vampires seem scary and powerful in a way that you expect. That's something that I really don't like in a lot of vampire romances. I'm thinking, girl, you're a human being. <laughs> he can knock you against a tree and break every bone in your body, and you're saying that to him. And so I thought this was realistic in how she and other human characters interacted with the vampires. And I just thought it was fascinating. The whole setup for this book is that no one in this world knows that vampires exist. And so we spend a lot of the book figuring out their weaknesses or the sun. They can't have silver touch them. And so I just thought it was fun. It was every everything to me. There was a masquerade ball at Halloween. Everything I wanted out of a vampire book, I'll be honest. And so this was an easy five stars. This was everything, everything I ever wanted. Very kitschy, very campy, and just perfectly vampire. When I say I want vampire stories, this is what I'm talking about. So I am eagerly anticipating the second book in this trilogy. This is one of my favorite books of the year. It's kind of in my top four. So we are moving into my top three. I have my top book semi locked in, but I'm just going to say these are my top three and I'm not going to say that any one of them in particular is my favorite. We have Jade War by Fonda Lee. This is standing in more broadly for the Greenbone Saga trilogy as a whole because I really couldn't pick which book was my favorite. I think I would pick Jade War because this is the second book in the trilogy and I always want to celebrate when a second book really ups the ante and is actually better than the first book. That is such a rare experience, but that is what you experience reading the Greenbone Saga. This definitely leveled up. This is a trilogy that is all about two rival gangs. The magic system is around Jade. Jade kind of gives you enhanced abilities that you might even say are a little bit on the level of an enhanced drug. So if you're someone who doesn't really like fantasy, but you're someone who wants to read something that has a little bit more complex politicking than some other books, I still say take a chance on this because the fantasy elements you can easily think of in a different way, in a more realistic way, let's say. I love a good story about a gang, about a mafia. And so I was set up to really, really like this. And I'll be honest, I truly think objectively speaking, these are the best books that I read all year. Because I think in terms of how they were written, how they were characterized, and clearly how they were plotted, this is some of the most brilliant writing I've ever had the privilege to read. I was blown away by this, and I just recently finished this trilogy. It was amazing to read how the trilogy ended and know that you could look back on the earlier books so fondly because you could see how she had set up certain plot threads. It was so brilliantly done, in my opinion, that I felt like Fonda Lee must have worked with the ending in mind and then kind of worked backwards, and I just think it was so smartly done. I feel like everything had a place. I don't feel like any word was wasted. Something was going on in nearly every chapter that propelled the plot forward or allowed you to understand the characters better. There was nothing filler here. There was nothing needless because I felt like everything added up to a very perfect whole. And I feel like I said this every time I reviewed one of these books, but the characterization was just so special because you knew kind of instantly who each character was and you also knew 
how they would react in any given situation. You knew exactly what they would say or how they would feel during a certain conversation or some kind of politicking event. You had such a great knowledge of the characters that what they did next in some ways didn't shock you. And to me, I think that's really, really remarkable because I think it means the characters were set up so incredibly well. This is brilliant to me. This is the best adult fantasy series, I'm going to say it, that I've read since Game of Thrones. It's also just in general, some of the best writing that I have ever had the privilege of reading. Truly, I think these are some of the best books that I have ever read. And as reading these books, reading this trilogy, made me look back on other books that I've given five stars and I thought, who am I? I didn't even have taste. I didn't even know what was out there to read. I mean, these are incredible. This is literature. We then have The Cruel Prince, which of course is standing in for The Cruel Prince trilogy. This blew me away. I feel like I'm so late to this train, but oh my gosh, I love the Fae. I'm a big Fae reader. I think if you have been following my channel for any length of time, you know that. But for some reason, I had kind of steered clear of this trilogy because I didn't like some of Holly Black's earlier books. And so I just did not think this was going to be for me. My gosh, was I wrong? This was everything. I mean, truly, this gave me everything I have ever wanted on a silver platter. Talk about characterization. The main character of this Jude, my favorite character, not just of the year, but possibly one of my favorite characters I've ever read. I love her so much. And so Jude is a human who has been raised in the Fae world, and the Fae don't really like that. So she's been bullied, and by bullying, I mean some incredibly crazy stuff has happened to her. And so she sets out to best them. And so in some ways, this book is a little bit of a revenge story. In other ways, there is kind of a good enemies to lovers romance throughout this series. A lot of people sell this series as romance. That's the wrong thing to do. So much more is going on than two people getting together. But my gosh, the romance is absolutely incredible. This is enemies to lovers. I mean, there is a scene where they're kissing each other and he says, I hate you. And she said, I hate you too. And it's like violent. I just love it. When I say I want enemies to lovers, this is what I'm talking about. They did legitimately hate each other for legitimate reasons before they got together. A lot of enemies to lovers is very watered down. That is not the case here. These people really hate each other. And so the romance is absolutely incredible. It is fiery. I felt it coming off the page. This was incredible to me on every single level. It's got to be some of the best fae that I've ever read because it was the fae as I like to see them. Kind of folklore-esque fae. They're very tricky. They're very naughty. They can't lie. And they also have kind of a weirdness to their look that I also really appreciate. But really the reason this series got five stars is Jude. Jude did every single thing I wanted her to do. You know, when you're reading a book and somebody's getting bullied or somebody's getting talked down to and you think to yourself, I would not let that stand. I would come back on him. I would say something right back. Jude did it every time. And so I just really appreciated her character. I think a lot of people will say she was kind of unlikable and that she was mean. Gosh, that's why I liked her. I love Jude. I love Jude. I would follow Jude into battle. Card in the love interest, love him. I mean, also would follow him into battle, but it took me a long time to warm up to him. But this series is incredible. I see why everyone has been talking about it. I see why it's a book series that most people recommend. This is really top tier in terms of Fae books for me. This might actually be my favorite Fae book I've ever read. And so I am definitely late to this party, but I see what y'all have been talking about and I am sorry that I waited for so long. We're technically at number one. This book kind of is number one. This is a book that I read maybe third or fourth this year, and I knew instantly there was probably going to be nothing else to top it. And in a year where I have had more five stars than any other, it is shocking to say that this book still remained at the top for me, and that is The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. Now, if you don't normally watch my channel, first of all, hi, welcome, I hope you subscribe, I hope you like what you see, but you probably don't know that I am obsessed with Mary Shelley. And so many of you who have read this and don't have an obsession with Mary Shelley might think this is a weird one to put as your top book of the year because in some ways, is this a thriller? Is this a mystery? I think it took a long time to get there in terms of those aspects. But this book is also a retelling of Mary Shelley's life, especially the period of time in which she was writing Frankenstein. And so the retelling is that the poets, Byron and Shelley and all that, they're a rock band 
who go to stay in a villa in the 70s in Italy. And Mary Shelley is writing kind of a horror classic similar to Frankenstein. There is a murder that happens in the 1970s timeline and in a modern day timeline, two writers go and stay at the same villa and they're talking about the murder, they're talking about the case, but they're also talking about the Mary Shelley character writing one of the most instrumental horror classics. The reason this book gets five stars, the reason why it's my favorite of the year, is the research that Rachel Hawkins put in to Mary's life. This was incredible. This is easily the best book on Mary Shelley that I've ever read, and it was a retelling. But something that was also really special about this is how well done Claire, who is Mary Shelley's stepsister, and a lot of people don't know that Mary had a stepsister, but she was done very well in this. Claire is always painted as a hanger on and she's always depicted as very pathetic. And this book gave her such life, such meaning. It was really profound. I, honestly, I was moved by this book. And the author's note is actually to Mary and Claire. Very sweet. As far as I'm concerned, this book is perfect because it is so incredible how well Mary Shelley is talked about and framed in this novel. Not just is there the retelling with a character that stands in for her in the 1970s, but the current day storyline with our two female writers also parallels Mary and Claire in an interesting way. And the relationship our main character has with her husband is very much coded as similar to the relationship between Mary and Percy Shelley. This book is brilliant for that alone. So I put this as a favorite, maybe for a different reason to most people. I think a lot of people are just reading this as a regular mystery thriller, but for somebody who is genuinely obsessed with Mary Shelley, this book had it all. This book really did everything for me. And so this has remained my favorite. It was one of the first books that I read this year and I knew then I would have it on this list, but I'm still kind of shocked that it remained at the top of the pile. These are all of my favorite books of the year. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these. I would love to know what your favorite books of the year are. I hope that 2024 is just as strong a reading year for me, honestly, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.